Hey everyone, today in this video I'll be explaining to you in very simple terms what is celiac disease, what are the symptoms, how do you test for it, and what do you do about it, what's the treatment? Okay, so let's start with the definition of celiac disease. But actually, before you tell you that, I myself have celiac disease, so I have, you know, I have kind of firsthand uh, knowledge. I've been uh, living the dream uh, since I found out in 2009, 2008, uh, that I had celiac disease. So let me tell you what it is. So celiac disease, by definition, is a autoimmune condition uh, when you are genetically predisposed to it, and it is triggered by eating uh, wheat, barley, or rye. There's proteins in those foods called, broadly speaking, gluten, that uh, trigger this autoimmune condition. And what happens is basically uh, your immune system mounts a response to the protein gluten that's in wheat, barley, and rye. And as part of doing that, uh, it cross-reacts with uh, some of your own tissues. And what that means is, is as your immune system tries to fight off because it thinks it's trying, it thinks it needs to kill the gluten. Uh, it actually starts killing off your own tissues, and so that's just a real simple way of thinking about it. Now, depending on who you read, uh, it's estimated like one in a hundred people worldwide have celiac disease, but only about thirty percent actually get uh, properly diagnosed. And what most people think about when they think about celiac disease intuitively, or kind of what they've heard, is they think about it being a gastrointestinal problem, right? You eat wheat and it causes you know, diarrhea or bloating or something like that. And that is true for some people, but the actual symptoms of celiac disease can are, are actually, it's going to kind of blow your mind. There's actually more non-gastrointestinal symptoms than there are GI symptoms. It's more common for celiac disease to cause hormone problems, endocrine problems, uh, neurological problems, uh, than it is uh, GI problems. So this is still a serious condition. Sometimes people, I don't know what happened, but somewhere in the popular culture, you know, since a lot of people follow a gluten-free diet for, you know, health reasons, um, a lot of people seem to think that celiac disease is like not a big deal, but it is a very big deal, as I'm going to show you. The things that it can do to you are uh, quite impactful. Um, there are more than like 200 known uh, celiac disease sort of classic symptoms, but I'm just going to go through a chart here for you. So if you think about a kid, what might be the symptoms of celiac disease? That they're having a problem with wheat uh, that is causing an, an autoimmune problem, right? Well, look at this list. You've got abdominal bloating and pain. You know, that kind of makes sense. People, people understand that. Anxiety and depression. Now, that's a neurological problem. ADHD, learning disabilities. Chronic diarrhea, constipation, more GI symptoms. Damage to tooth enamel, delayed puberty, failure to thrive. That's actually what I see more than anything uh, in, in the pediatric cases I've seen is this sort of inability for the child to gain weight and to, you know, match up on the curves with their peers. Uh, I've seen that a lot. They can also get fatigue, uh, intestinal gas, headaches, iron deficiency, anemia. So it's very important that that even gets checked for and checked for correctly. Uh, irritability, nausea and vomiting, uh, GI stuff like pale, uh, uh, foul smelling stools, seizures and lack of muscle coordination, short stature kind of related to that, failure to thrive. Uh, and weight loss. Now, if you look at an adult, there's a lot of very similar GI symptoms, right? We've got abdominal pain, bloating and gas, constipation, diarrhea, but then we've got cognitive impairment. So you have to understand that celiac disease, yes, it starts with something you eat, but it can affect so many different symptoms. And with every person, the symptoms can be uh, variable. Like it's very important that whoever your primary care doctors are, whoever physicians you are, if you're sick or if a family member has been sick, and they're ill and no one knows what it is, uh, it's definitely time to check this. Now, if you already know that family members have celiac disease and one of you or your family members is showing up with some sort of chronic illness or one of these symptoms, I'm telling you, that is the first thing you should suspect. Don't waste time checking a bunch of other things. Look for this first. Anyway, uh, there's depression and anxiety, fatigue, headaches and migraines, again, iron deficiency, anemia. Uh, her dermatitis or pediformis, which is due to uh, transglutaminase 6 cross-reactivity. I'll get to that in just a second. Then there's joint pain, missed periods, that's an endocrine problem, mouth, ulcer, mouth ulcers and canker sores, nausea and vomiting, osteoporosis and osteomalacia. I got a video on that. There's kind of two ways that that can occur. One's through malabsorption of calcium and one's through cross-reaction with the osteocytes. Peripheral neuropathy, uh, reduced function of the spleen, and weight loss. Now, all those symptoms being said, 
here's what you need to understand about that. Um, celiac disease starts, you know, with ingesting gluten, and it progresses into an autoimmune condition. Now, the distinction is this. What makes it autoimmune? Well, we're going to get into testing in just a second, and I'll explain that. But there's uh, enzymes that your body uses to process gluten, and the one that we look at the most is called tissue transglutaminase, or transglutaminase 2, okay? And there's also in your body transglutaminase 6, which you find in the skin, and there's transglutaminase, excuse me, transglutaminase 3, rather, that's in the skin, and then there's 6, uh, which is in the nervous system. And those are probably the mechanism with how celiac disease causes so many different types of symptoms. So the takeaway is, man, there's a lot of different symptoms. I hope whoever I'm, whatever doctor I'm working with understands that whatever I'm having could be those things, right? And they have to test for it. Now, there's three kinds of celiac disease. There's classical, which is basically where you have all the signs and symptoms of malabsorption, like diarrhea and, and uh, you know, uh, fat malabsorption, where you kind of pass fat through your stool. Uh, weight loss, and then like, you know, in, chi in children, you know, uh, kind of failure to thrive. That's kind of your classic, you know, textbook celiac disease. But then there's non-classical, right? And these people may have mild gastrointestinal symptoms or not none at all. And then we have this whole, all, that, all those things I've been showing you, they can have any number of those things. Uh, they could have unexplained elevated uh, liver enzymes like AST and ALT. I've seen that a bunch of times. That's due to cross-reaction with hepatocytes. They can have uh, reduced bone mass and fractures. They can have uh, B12 deficiency, can't lose weight, all these hormonal abnormalities, uh, anxiety. So again, it's very important that whoever you're seeing, if you have these symptoms, understands that, wow, celiac disease, or maybe a close cousin of that, could be responsible. How, how do we check for that right away? Right now, silent celiac disease, I think, is probably uh, a real dangerous one because, well, I don't know if it's dangerous, but basically, uh, people don't have any symptoms, but they have evidence on imaging or like biopsy that there is damage to the small intestine because that's the first place that a lot of damage occurs is the small intestine because you know that's where you're processing the gluten, and we call that enteropathy. But silent means they don't really have any other symptoms, but if they go on a gluten free diet. Uh, their small intestine still heals. So that's cool. We call that silence. So we've talked about right now kind of like what celiac disease is, kind of what the symptoms are. They're all over the place. Uh, I talked about the three kind of uh, subtypes of celiac disease. Now let's talk about testing. So testing, can, this can be a little bit controversial because there's some gastroenterologists that swear the only way that you can diagnose celiac disease is through a biopsy. But that's not true. Uh, the literature is pretty clear now that you don't have to do a biopsy to identify whether someone has celiac disease. The, one of the blood tests you can do, especially in kids, is called tissue transglutaminase, otherwise known as transglutaminase number two. And if you've got elevated antibodies to that, well, that's probably because you have celiac disease. That's been kind of validated for that purpose. Then there's also endomesial antibodies, and the endomesium is just a, a layer of your GI tract. Kind of the same, the same logic is that if you've got antibodies to that, that's probably because you've developed an autoimmune response that's been provoked by eating gluten. Then there's something called deamidated gliadin peptide, which is basically a, a form of gluten that's been partially digested or partially processed. Uh, that's been pretty well validated for celiac disease. Now, where can you get all this? Well, LabCorp does them, Quest does them. In my practice, very often, I do kind of broader testing than that, and I don't, I probably shouldn't mention this now, but I will. But um, Cyrix Labs does a, a panel called like a wheat and proteome reactivity panel. And it's a very broad panel that looks at different pieces of wheat, different uh, forms of wheat in the different stages of w when we process it. And it's extremely useful because this, this is probably the most important thing I can tell you. Celiac disease uh, is a kind of wheat slash gluten sensitivity, but it's not the only kind. Really important. So it's like this. A dog, a poodle is a dog, right? But not all dogs are poodles. So you could have, and I've got other videos that we're going to do on this, uh, what we call non-celiac gluten sensitivity or non-celiac wheat sensitivity. So someone could do celiac tests on you and they'd be negative, but that doesn't mean you don't have a problem with wheat. Okay, that's why I like to do that Cyrex panel. So another little kind of takeaway is make sure you're working with someone that understands that. Uh, because I've seen so many people think that they were okay because their doctor met, met well, did the celiac test, they were negative, and they said, hey, you can eat gluten. Uh, but that was not the case. And so for years they suffered when they didn't have to, and they show up in my office and we find out, yeah, you really can't eat wheat.
So anyway, uh, there's also, in terms of testing, there's video capsule endoscopy, which is pretty good. You know, they go in and they look for macroscopic uh, atrophy and alterations in your small intestine. There's a gluten challenge, which sometimes doctors say, well, if you've been on a gluten-free diet, you really can't do these tests because you have to have adequate exposure to gluten and wheat in order for these things to even show up, right? And that's topic for another day. But basically, if you've been on a gluten-free diet for six months, don't do any of these tests I'm talking about because they're probably going to show up negative and you'll get a false sense of security. But by the same token, if you already know, <laughs> hey, if I take away gluten, I feel better. And when I add it back in, I feel worse. Do you really need to do a test? You know? Uh, but again, I don't want you to DIY things too much. Make sure you're working with someone that's very experienced in this and can tell you, kind of guide you through it. Um, there is a thing called genotyping, HLA genotyping, and uh, people with celiac disease, like me, have a, uh, one or both what we call HLA DQ2 or DQ8. And that's not strictly speaking just a celiac thing. About 25 to 30% of the population, generally speaking, has that. But if you've got those genotypes, that means you have an increased risk of celiac disease. Um, one of the big problems with celiac disease is about 80% of people are uh, undiagnosed, right? 80% of people with celiac disease who, who really have it are currently undiagnosed. Now, why is that? Well, it's for a couple reasons. One is, remember that just kind of spectrum of symptoms? There's not like a, oh, this is a core symptom. It's always going to mean you have celiac disease. It requires some thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of well-meaning doctors have kind of abdicated their thinking ability. They've kind of given that up and just said, well, uh, we're going to do some tests. And they don't really put the pieces together, you know. They mean well. They just don't do it because, you know, insurance and, you know, uh, time pressure. And, you know, look, if you don't have something really obvious, yeah, they're probably going to send you off to a specialist, you know, or tell you that you're depressed. Uh, I'll get off that soapbox. So the, the first reason why celiac disease remains really uh, undiagnosed is that. And the second is, is that there's just kind of lack of adequate training in medical school and even in residency programs to learn how to recognize this and how to think about it. Because this, all, all this stuff is in the research published literature. It's just that too many doctors don't know it and aren't applying it. So kind of for me to summarize here, I think if you go back and look at the chapters, you'll see, you can go back through, you know, what, you know, what are we talking about? What celiac is, you know, what are the symptoms or what is the testing for it? But one thing I really want you to understand is, is this is just the beginning because, as I alluded to earlier, there is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. There is non-celiac wheat sensitivity, right? Those are different entities, but ultimately they're kind of the same thing, which is you can't eat wheat, right? So make sure that you are working with someone that understands how complex this is and understands all the differences between these different conditions, all the testing. Now, the treatment... It's pretty simple. If you've got celiac disease, it's a lifelong gluten-free diet, at least, because there's some problems because gluten can cross-react with other foods. So I've got other videos on that. Make sure you read up on those because just going gluten-free sometimes is not enough. You've also got to eliminate other foods that, to your immune system, look very similar to gluten. And to your immune system, you maybe think you're eating gluten-free, but to your immune system, you're not. So make sure you're working with someone that knows about that, too.